I drew the parallel before between moms and church. The Bible calls the church the bride of Christ, the wife, the mother, all the people within that church. And as I was thinking about that relationship this past week, a few things came to my mind of how exactly our moms can represent our faith, what we can learn from them. So there's probably a hundred thousand of these examples, but these are the ones that came to my mind for a new baby coming into the world. I thought, you know, with a mother, there's potential there for life. There's potential there for life. But until the baby is conceived, that, that life has not yet begun. I thought about that in terms of the church. What is the potential that we have within these walls and with the people that we know for new life to come? Every person that we know is a potential child of God, but not yet. Not until God steps in and brings life where there wasn't. There's potential. Every human is potential kingdom life, potential souls coming alive, but not yet. That's what Patrick preached last week, right? Not far from the kingdom. But even if you're not far, if you're close, not far is not in. Not far means like seeking or interested or curious, maybe ready. But that's the same as a mother before she gets pregnant. Ready, waiting, potential. I thought that really speaks to me. All the people around us are like potential new lives. Not just unborn children who are growing, but even before they're conceived, just potential life. Every single person. Every single egg in that mother, every single person in our lives is just the same. And with our investment in their lives, with God's intervention in their lives, that's the growth, the birth, and eventually the new life in God's kingdom. So I thought about that. I thought about choice when it comes to mothers. But think of it from the baby's perspective. The baby doesn't have a choice as to whether it's going to be born or not born. You know, it's the choice of the parents. It's not the choice of the child. That's exactly the same way it is for every person around us who doesn't believe in Christ, who doesn't believe in God. They don't have a choice to believe. Because we are sinful, and a certain person who is dead in their sin can't choose to become alive any more than the unconceived baby can choose to come to life. The Bible's pretty clear about this. We cannot decide we're going to be saved. It is not our choice. It is God stepping into our lives in some way. Some people, it's been through like a sunset or experiencing creation, just God somehow made an impact. Their response is to receive and say, yes. That's what faith is. Faith is saying yes to God, who's always there and who intervenes in everyone's life in some way. Some people, he's just overwhelming again and again. Some people get glimpses here and there, but everyone has to answer that question, but it's a response question. We do not choose God. He chose us before the creation of the world. It's our role to just say yes to him. Same thing with a baby. Can't choose, but it accepts, it receives, and it grows. I just thought it was a beautiful parallel, parallel for us to think about. How about with the baby as it's growing? This is nine months, 10 months, which for pregnant moms feels like 300 years. This time period, baby's not born immediately. When it's conceived, the baby has to grow to this place in this time where it's ready. And I've had conversations with people who have gotten to that moment where they said, I'm ready to take a step into faith. I'm ready to receive. And I can't remember a time where I've talked to someone who's in that spot when they couldn't look back through their whole life and be like, you know what? When I think about it, God was there through my aunt in that moment. <laughs> And God was there when I was miraculously saved from that car crash. And God was there when that thing happened. And God, I had a sense of peace at that time when I went through this that wasn't from me. They can look and see the gestation of their soul. Where God has been involved every step of the way. They just couldn't see it yet, weren't ready to admit it, and weren't ready to accept it. But that's how it works spiritually. And for some people, it can be a short time. Like they hear, and in a moment, they say, yes, I believe. So for them, it's just like, I receive. But then as they look back, you know, you know what? God wasn't surprised by my acceptance today. God was preparing me 
for this acceptance, teaching me things that I needed to know so when I got to this moment, it would make sense. Some of those things that we need to know are like, we're not all that we think we are and that we can't do everything we think we can do and that it's not just all going to work out if we try harder. Like those are the lessons we learn and then we get to a moment where we say, oh, dear God, help me. We receive, accept, he steps in and we say, ah, I never could have realized how much I needed God unless I had been prepared by a bunch of my own failures up to this point. But now it makes sense. How about dependency? Another one of these great mother-child relationships. Okay, the baby's born. Great. It's been birthed out into the world. It is not independent in any way. Just because we have new life does not mean we're good. Okay, boom. I went to a concert. It was a Christian concert, and someone called me to accept Christ into my heart. I did a good. Okay, so now I just live on my own, do my own thing. It's not how babies work, and that's not how spiritual babies work. The church, the mother, is supposed to be the nurturer, the family, the protector, the teacher, raising up the child so that it can know what's what. How do you walk as a Christian? How do you talk as a Christian? What do Christians look like? How do Christians help one another? What's it look like? Well, the baby looks at the mother and says, oh, the new Christian looks at the church and says, oh. But sometimes the new Christian looks at the church and says, eh, right? Instead of this moment of inspiration, it's kind of like this, wah, wah, the church. But we're supposed to aspire to be like Christ. And so where we fail, we just say, you know what? Sometimes parents fail. Michelle, how many times do you and I say that to our kids every week? Don't answer that. Don't answer that. We say it all the time. Like, parents don't always get it right. But it's our responsibility to try to raise you up the best we can. And when we fail, we admit it and we try to work through it. That would be a great church to be a part of when people fail, just saying, ah, we're striving to be Christ-like, but our sinful nature just kind of got in the way this week. That's all right. God forgives, extends grace. Let's work through it and go further. So dependency, we're dependent upon one. That's the church. The church stays dependent upon one another. And if you live to be 300, you're still probably only a toddler in spiritual terms. So it's not like we're trying to get all mature and grown up and then become independent from the church and from Christ. No. We might not be babies anymore, but we're still children of God. Church is a mother. Church raises the children that God gives life to. So with that in mind, I want to focus on one specific aspect of the life cycle of a Christian, because it's the one that I think sometimes there's the most confusion on. It's the one I want to make sure that we're all crystal clear on as we leave here today. What does it look like for someone to actually be born spiritually? How do you know you're alive in God? Are you sure that you're saved? Are you sure that you're born Again, are you sure that you are a new life? Because it is entirely possible to be just like Cornelius, who we talked about two weeks ago. The Bible says he was a God-fearing man. He gave alms to the poor. He prayed every day. And the Bible says when um, this vision comes to uh, him and to Peter to say they should meet and and introduce him to Christ, the angel says to um, Cornelius, your prayers and your incense have come up before the Lord like a memorial. It's like, God is watching over this man, but he is not saved. So it is very possible to go to church all the time, to pray all the time, to know a lot of things about God, but not be saved. The problem is Satan uses this mysterious gray area all the time to make us doubt our faith when we shouldn't. Oh, I failed this week. Maybe I'm not really saved. I have these questions about the Bible that I can't get answered. Maybe I'm not actually saved. How do I know I'm saved? I believe, but sometimes I don't believe. Right? We all find ourselves in this. We have to know what that means. And it's really, it's a very simple definition, but we have to be so rock solid in it that when things happen to us, we don't doubt our faith. We say, I might be the worst Christian out there, but I know I'm a Christian. We need to be sure about this. And the people that are around us, they might be the nicest people in the world, the nicest Corneliuses. They may put you to shame with how generous they are to the poor and the lives and the prayers, that, but that does not mean they're saved necessarily because Cornelius is an example of that exact person, a beautiful unsaved person. So what's it mean? 
And for us in the room, once we get this definition straight, are we saved? Are we not? Well, let's just answer the question and know one way or the other. And if not, then let's pray together. Let's commit. And if we are, then let's not ask anymore. Let's just know and move forward. Because if we're struggling with whether we've ever been born, <laughs> for the infant, we're like staying at day one of our spiritual life forever. Staying at day one. We're never going to learn to walk. We're never going to learn to be weaned. We're never going to learn to eat solid food. We're never going to do any of those stuff. We're never going to grow up. We're never going to have our own spiritual children. We're never going to get there because we're stuck in the rut. It's like a skipping record. Just dated myself. Kids, a record is... A, <laughs> it's a skipping record. <laughs> vinyl. They call it vinyl now. You can use vinyl. <laughs> dated myself. Hopefully that means I'm not an infant anymore. But spiritually, physically, they're two different things. We need to know, otherwise we'll get stuck and we'll never grow up in our faith. I want us to grow up in our faith. I want to see people who are alive in their faith. And that does not mean perfect. If we try to pretend to be perfect with each other, I actually know that we're not right in our faith. I know, because Christians believe in grace, which means we stumble all the time, but God is good. That's Christianity, not perfect people. Perfect God, forgiven people, right? So we have to know these things. We have to know these things. So that's where we're going to focus. We're not going to talk about all those stages of the life cycle that we could compare mothers to. I just want to go straight to birth. When a mother gives birth in the hospital, there is no doubt that a baby was just born. No one is confused as to whether that baby is born or not yet. I would love it if it was that way for us as Christians. It's just no doubt. You're a baby of God, and you may be screaming, and you may be dirty, but there is no doubt of who you are. How great would that be? What confidence would that give us to move on instead of just staying, <coughs> wondering, doubting? So I had the opportunity yesterday to go to L Street Mission. I go there about once a month, and I lead a devotional right before the lunch. Uh, for those of you that are looking for a place to serve, they're always looking for extra hands. It's every Saturday from about 1.30 to about 3.30, give or take. There's a devotional, and then a bunch of tables set out, and the homeless folk from Brockton uh, come in, enjoy a meal, and uh, afterwards they hand out clothes. So if you want to donate clothes, we'll bring them over. If you want to go serve soup, go serve soup. It's every single week. But... Um, Yesterday, I felt like this question is one that I wanted to challenge the homeless community with as well. Like, are they saved? Do they know? And so these are the three thoughts that I gave to them, feeling like there's no difference between their community and our community. This week, this is what God's put on my heart. We all need to know this, and it doesn't matter where we are in life. I need to know this. And so this is how I summarize it for them, and this is how I'm going to summarize it for us. There are three statements, I think, that if you can make those three statements, you are saved unequivocally. First one is, God, I'm sorry. There is no one who is saved on this earth who has ever been saved or who will ever be saved who has not stopped and gotten on their knees and just said, God, I'm sorry. Because you cannot come to God full of sin and be like, save me. He's like, you're filthy. But if you don't admit that, you don't see that, there's no cleansing available. He's like, you need to admit this. You need to recognize this. So salvation starts with, I'm sorry. But it also includes this phrase, God, I'll do whatever it takes. I'll do whatever it takes. I don't care, whatever it takes. That's a life of obedience. That's a life following God. That's a life of discipleship. That's not just the, yeah, okay, forgive me for my sins, and then I go and do whatever I want for the rest of my life. No. How do you know that baby's alive? There should be no doubt. When a baby is born into Christ, there should be things that happen. And that baby's like, well, what does it look like? How do I eat? How do I walk? How do I run? How do I talk? You got to learn all these things so you should see some growth and some hunger. And that baby just says, I'll do whatever it takes. I I've got to walk. The little ones who are trying to walk are like pulling themselves up all over the place, trying to get, they want it. Learning to talk. Eloise is trying to read and she's doing such a good job. And she's like, spell this for me. Spell this for me. What is that? So she's eager for it. There's life there. I can see it. She's like, I'll do whatever it takes. I just want to move forward. I'm hungry for it. I'm alive. <clears throat> you cannot just say you're sorry and then do whatever you want. There's I'm sorry and then I'll do whatever it takes. Jesus defined this as picking up your cross and following me. If anybody doesn't pick up his cross and follow me, he can't be a follower of mine. 
But if we just stay here, these are the people that are trying to do the right thing, trying to follow Jesus, trying to do the right thing, trying to be a good person. What am I supposed to do? Oh, okay, I'm supposed to do this. I'm supposed to do this. And this, parents, is what our kids think we're like. Do this, don't do this. Do this, don't do this. Do this, don't do this. A bunch of rules. But we recognize we're trying to train them for something good. And when we say don't talk that way, it's not just because it's a house rule. It's because if you grow up talking that way, it's going to be bad for you. The way you hurt other people is going to be a negative thing in the world. So we're trying to cut that off early so it doesn't grow to what it could. So the, tell me what I'll do. I'll do whatever it takes is for something good down the road. That's the way Jesus is for us. Prune some of these things. Change some of these things. Drop some of these things. Let go of some of these things. All right, Jesus, I'll do whatever it takes. But not just so we can be good little Christian soldiers, little robots for Jesus who do the right thing all the time. And then when we fail, we try to like cover it up and mask it up so that no one knows we failed. No. Grow us into something good. And so we have to believe that. That's the hope of our faith. So the third statement is, God, it's going to be okay. It's going to be okay. It is going to be okay. Every Christian believes it's going to be okay. In their marriage, in their faith, in their ministry, in eternity, it's going to be okay. Just having faith. Because God's in control and it's not about me and it's not up to my best efforts to make sure I do it perfectly. Rules, fixes, laws. No, this is a grace thing that we're talking about. And so because God's in charge of this process, I just have to say whatever it takes, I'll do my part and you will work all things together for the good, for those that love you and those that are called according to your purpose. If you don't have hope, then you're religious. You're not saved. You're not free. (laughs) You're not filled with the joy of the Holy Spirit, which is what comes from just knowing it's going to be okay. These are the early Christians who got thrown into the gladiator's pit and killed and went in singing hymns and died because it's going to be okay. If we get put into a pit with a wild animal, we don't think it's going to be okay because we're trying to preserve our life. But this life is the thing that passes away. It's not what we're living for. We're living for something better. So it actually is going to be okay, even if you're about to die. It's going to be okay. And what can't God do? So it's going to be okay. This is not eternal optimism. This is faith. Because God works all things together, even bad things, terrible atrocities, works them together. Somehow he picks up the pieces and does the work of redemption. That's his job. It's his passion. It's what he wants to do. So I shared those three statements with scriptures like 1 John 1.8. Um, If anyone claims to be without sin, he deceives himself and calls God a liar. So for all of us here who think we're okay, okay, you can think that, but you're calling God a liar because he says you're not okay. He says, I'm not okay. So if he says I'm not okay, then I'm not okay. I'm sorry. But I'm sorry, and I don't want to just keep doing it. If we say we're sorry and then just keep repeating the same offenses, okay, you're sorry, but nothing's changing. I'm sorry, but nothing's, that's not salvation. I'm sorry, and then I sin the same way. I'm sorry, and then I sin this for the rest of my life. And just, this is who I am. No, no, God makes you new. So you got to get there. But you start with the you're sorry, and then you just say, I'll do whatever it takes, and it's going to be okay. The reason that this works, these statements work in marriages as well, and with children and with friends is because we're talking about a relationship. A relationship with God. So the beautiful thing about these three statements is you can use them with every relationship they will work. So when you're at odds with your sister, with your brother, with your spouse, you're separated, and it isn't going to get better until someone steps across that gap. It's going to start with someone saying, I'm sorry. But not just repeating the cycle of I'm sorry, then I said I'm I'm sorry. I'm going to do whatever it takes. Tell me. Tell me. Tell me what it's going to take. I'll do whatever it takes. Because it's going to be okay. So this works with people. This is like a truth of the universe. It's how God's built it. It's how it works. And when you read scriptures like Romans 15, 13, that says, May the God of hope fill you with all joy and all peace in believing so that by the power of the Holy Spirit you may abound in hope, we identify with that and we say, I have hope that my friend who I'm praying for, the list of people that we love so much, 
it's going to be okay. I have hope because God's in control and I'm not. So this is what salvation looks like. If every one of us here has had a moment where we've knelt down with God and said, I'm sorry, and we just said, tell me what to do, I'll do whatever it takes, and it's going to be okay, you are saved. The way Romans puts this is, whoever believes in his heart and confesses with his mouth will be, that Jesus Christ is Lord will be saved. There's the inward, and then there's the outward. There's the action, then there's the follow-through. That's what salvation is. It's believing, but not believing like I get it, believing like I'm doing it. Who was I talking with? Oh, yeah, that's right. I was talking with someone earlier this week, and he said he heard a great analogy for this, what faith is, believing, really saving faith. We've all seen pictures of parachutes. We've seen videos and whatever of people jumping out of planes wearing parachutes and saw them land. We know this can work. But if we stop right there, that's where Christianity stops for a lot of people. I believe that that works. Real faith, the way the Bible talks about it, is putting it on and stepping out of the plane. When you trust it enough to live it, then you know that you believe it. If we believe it like an objective thing, I think there's probably some of us in this room right here that believe Christianity is like a true sort of thing but we haven't put it on and stepped out to wear it, to own it. So if not, then you haven't said, God, I'm sorry, I'll do whatever it takes and it's going to be okay, so we're not saved. You might be near to the kingdom of God. You might know about things like hope and peace, but we need to have them. We need to receive them. And it will change everything. When the baby's born, you know it. You know it. Would you read a couple of scriptures with me? Stories in the book of Acts about this specific situation. We'll start with Acts 1. So we're in the New Testament. There are Bibles under your seats if you want to pull some out or feel free to just listen along. We can start with verse 4. Acts 1, 4. What does it look like for someone to be Saved. What does it take for someone to be saved? Are we saved? What does that even mean? Well, it means you've come alive. You've just come alive. We've received, we've accepted, we've stepped out of the womb into new life. So Acts 1 verse 4 gives this promise from Jesus. Listen to the specifics of the promise while he describes what faith looks like. So while staying with them, this is after Jesus has risen from the dead, he's staying and talking with them. He ordered them not to depart from Jerusalem, but to wait for the promise of the Father, which he said, you heard from me. For John, John the Baptist, he baptized with water, but you will be baptized with the Holy Spirit not many days from now. We're going to see it in an example in just a second. It's very possible to be baptized in a church with water and not have the Holy Spirit. To have it be some kind of religious ceremony that we did and have it just be about the water. It's when God enters into us and makes us new, that's when we're saved. It's not just being baptized. And whether your tradition was baptized as an infant, you know, water sprinkled on the baby, you know, close to birth or child dedication, that water is not what saves a baby. And even if you're an adult and say, like, I understand these things and are baptized, it's not the water which saves. It's when God's spirit changes a heart and makes you into someone else because you said, God, I'm sorry. I'll do whatever it takes. It's going to be okay. Faith. And you don't just think it. You step into it. So baptism with water is not the end of the story. It's not that I've had that done. I've been dunked, so I'm good. No. No. The water is a symbol. The Holy Spirit is what actually changes someone. And you recognize that the Holy Spirit isn't necessarily a mind thing. <laughs> we feel the Holy Spirit. And when you talk to Christians, sometimes you'll find that they can't like quit, put their finger on it. Like, tell me your most closest moment with God. And like, well, it was kind of like this, and I kind of felt him saying this. Or like, how do you know that you have the Holy Spirit? Like, well, when I'm in these situations, I feel this. Or when I have trouble, like this happens. Or I prayed, and then it's a heart thing. It's a feeling. We need to become spiritually sensitive. 
got to have our finger on the pulse of God through his spirit so we can feel what he's saying. It's not just knowing about. That is not what saves people. So look at the next chapter, right? This is what Jesus said. Now in Acts chapter 2, Peter's preaching. So he preaches, you've got to be saved. What does he say people have to do to be saved? Acts 2, verse 37. No, verse 6. 2, 36. 2, 36. Before I confuse you entirely. Acts 2, 36. Peter concludes his whole sermon about what it means to become a Christian, what it means to be saved. And he says, Let all the house of Israel therefore know for certain that God has made him both Lord and Christ, this Jesus whom you crucified. So make no doubt. Have no doubt about it, Peter says. Jesus is God. Jesus rose from the dead. He's the Messiah. Have no doubt. So now verse 37. Now when the crowd, <clears throat> when the crowd heard this, they were cut to the heart. It's the I'm sorry moment. They were cut to the heart. And they said to Peter and the rest of the apostles, Brothers, what should we do? I'll do whatever it takes. So verse 38. Peter said to them, Repent. Say you're sorry. Be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of your sins, and you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. So that's what you get when you do whatever it takes based upon true repentance. You get the Holy Spirit. This is the promise. Verse 39, this promise is for you, and it's for your children, and it's for all who are far off, everyone whom the Lord our God calls to himself. So with many other words, he was very wordy. I appreciate that. I feel like that's an endorsement that I can talk for as long as I want. With many other words, he bore witness and he continued to challenge them, saying, save yourselves from this corrupt generation. So those who received his word, that's the baby's job. Baby does not make a choice to become born. Baby receives the word. Those who received his word were baptized with water, in the name of Jesus Christ, to receive the Holy Spirit. And those that were added that day were about 3,000 souls. Two more stories, and these are the ones where it becomes very practical. I hope you, you may see yourself or others in these last two. They're both in Acts, so flip a few chapters on. Acts chapter 8, verse 14. Acts 8, 14. This may even describe some of us in the room today. Acts chapter 8, verse 14. Now, when the apostles at Jerusalem heard that Samaria, it's like the neighboring county, had received the word of God, they sent to them Peter and John. So they sent some ambassadors for Jesus to these people. And they came down and prayed for them that they what? They might receive the Holy Spirit. Not that they might join a church. Not that they might understand. That they might receive Actually, come alive. Receive God's Spirit. For he, meaning God's Spirit, had not yet fallen on any of them. They had only been baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus. So they laid their hands on them, and they received the Holy Spirit. Jesus said, go and make disciples and baptize them in the Father and the Son the Holy Spirit. They hadn't heard what it means to actually be made new, to receive God's Spirit. So they were believers. They believed, but they had not yet received the Spirit. And so Peter and John are like, well, hey, you're not fully born. Let's get you born here. You are like full term, ready to go. You believe. But after that belief, you got to put on that parachute. you got to step out. You have to receive God's gift and be made new. Christianity is not a self-help religion, how you can be a better you in 30 to 90 days, how if you try your hardest, you could be just like Jesus. I can't, you can't, but God can change you. This is for those who are coming out of recovery. You can't just want to not be addicted. It's got you. So you start with, it's got me, and I'm sorry. I'll do whatever it takes, but something outside of me is going to have to step in and help in this process because I can't do it on my own. But it's going to be okay. I've seen it be okay for other people, and it can be okay for me. True recovery, true salvation, true freedom. There's lots of us that know about Jesus and have not received the Holy Spirit. I'm convinced of it. Otherwise, the Christian church would look a lot more powerful and a lot more beautiful, a lot less legalistic 
and a lot less like everyone around us. We need the Holy Spirit. We need to be really fully conceived, full term, delivered, and living, and let there be no doubt about whether or not that baby's been born. Last story, last scripture, Acts chapter 19. Acts chapter 19, verse 1. Acts 19, 1. And it happened that while Apollos was in Corinth, Paul passed through the inland country and he came to Ephesus, and there he found some disciples. All right, well, there's disciples, those people following Jesus. His question wasn't, what have you learned about Jesus? His question wasn't, how much can you recite from the Bible? His question wasn't, how perfect are you acting day by day? How much are you getting right? How good are you? His question wasn't, how often do you attend church? His question, right to the heart of the issue, was, have you been born? Are you alive? He asks it like this. Did you receive the Holy Spirit when you believed? Did your intellectual believing of something result in some kind of new thing going on in you? They said, nope. We didn't even hear there was a Holy Spirit. What the heck is he? He said, then uh, rewind. What were you baptized into? And they said, into John's baptism. He's like, oh, oh okay. They've only ever heard about John. So that's old covenant. That's that God loves you, but you need to repent to be forgiven of your sins. You sin, you're forgiven, you sin, you're forgiven, you sin, you forget law and that sort of thing. Justice. Like, ah. Paul says, John baptized with the baptism of repentance, step one only, telling the people to believe in the one who was to come after him, which is Jesus. Now, on hearing this, because they were ready, they were sorry, but they were just sorry and nothing more. On hearing this, they were baptized into the name of the Lord Jesus. And when Paul had laid his hands on them, the Holy Spirit came on them. And they began speaking in tongues and prophesying. These miraculous fruit of the Spirit, gifts of the Spirit, start happening because the Holy Spirit showed up because they received. There were about 12 men in all. If I were to ask each one of us that question today, how would you answer it? Did you receive the Holy Spirit when you believed? Isn't it interesting to separate belief from the Holy Spirit? But I think that's the perfect question for Christianity today to ask, because I think we have a lot of belief, and we have very little Holy Spirit. A lot of knowledge and learning, but very little life change. Mothers, do you want to keep the baby past nine months, past 10 months, past 11 months, past 12 months? No, you're like aching to get that child out. That's exactly how God feels about so many of his people. He's aching for them to just be born again so that they can experience what that's like. And it's going to be traumatic, (laughs) but it's going to be beautiful, and it's going to grow, and it's going to be a miracle and a mystery, but it's going to be undeniable. I think God's begging for his almost born, believing, not far from the kingdom, children, to just take that step and say, God, I'm sorry, I'll do whatever it takes. It's going to be okay, you and me, because you've got this and you've got me. That's what salvation is. So if I asked you that, what would you say? Did you receive the Holy Spirit when you believed? Did you receive the Holy Spirit when you believed? Did you receive the Holy Spirit when you believed? Because if not, you may be part of this way coming closer to God, but you may not be saved. And that's no indictment on you, because we all have to take that same process. But if you're not there, can I urge you, please don't stop short. Why go all the way close and then not go full term? Not every baby that's conceived goes full term. And not every Christian that believes goes full term to new life. Jesus talked about this with the sower and the soil. There are some that crop up quick and then die away. There are some that don't at all. Some that grow but then are are crowded and choked out. Let's follow through. I'll do whatever it takes, God. It's going to be okay with you. Don't stop short. Don't stop short. I asked someone this question earlier this week because I was trying to think, like, how do I ask this? And what are some of the thoughts that we'll respond to? And I asked this dear sister in Christ, um, did you receive the Holy Spirit when you believed? How would you answer that question? She's like, oh, I know I definitely did. I was like, how did you know? 
She's like, for some unexplained reason, I cried for like two weeks straight. Oh, see, there's that feeling sort of thing. Something happened to this person who grew up knowing about God, and at that moment, something changed. Something was born. Something came alive. And for her, it came alive with probably lots of the I'm sorry, or maybe lots of it's going to be okay. She didn't describe what kind of tears they were, but something happened to her. That can never be taken away from her, no matter how hard life gets. She will never doubt that experience with the Holy Spirit. And there are many times where I and we are like, God, where are you? We need you. He's not like an on-demand sort of God where we command him and he shows up. But if we can look back to these moments, we're like, I can't deny and I will never deny and there's no taking away from me what happened there, then don't doubt your salvation ever again. Ever again. Don't doubt it. There's no reason to doubt it because it's a very simple formula. Do you believe that Jesus forgave your sins? Yeah, I've got sins and I need it. I'll do whatever it takes. Tell me. It's going to be okay. I feel that spirit, yep, you're saved. You're a Christian. Now it's a process of as a baby, as an infant, as a toddler, staying in the kind of like folds of the family long enough to get your feet under. How do do we walk? How do we talk? That's what the church is for. That's what we should be for, for one another. Help the babies grow up. Don't just give birth and leave them outside. People were praying for don't lead them to Christ to the I'm sorry moment and then be like, good luck. Like, no, nah, you got to be a spiritual mom now. Got to help them grow up. Got to help them survive when they're still dependent. This is what salvation is. It's got to go full term. So what I'd like to do is have us just take a moment for prayer here. I'll have Hope come forward. We're going to close in a final song. But after that song, I'm going to sit up here And I would like to invite anyone to come up and pray with me if you feel like you're somewhere in that process but not here yet. Why not today? Why not just say, you know what, I I do want to commit. And then knowing you've committed, knowing there's a repentance, knowing that there's commitment, knowing that there's hope, there's no more doubt. Now we just see what God does. We don't often do kind of altar call sort of moments in this church. It's not part of our regular weekly tradition. But today I felt like we cannot talk about being a mother and new life coming spiritually And then not ask who's ready for that. Who's ready to be done being stuck in the womb and who's itching to just get out and live. So if you're anywhere in that process, if you've believed for many, many years but have never received the Holy Spirit, great. I invite you to come up and pray with me. I'd love to pray with anybody who's interested.